Welcome to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's virtual public meeting presentation for the Jackson Ceramics Superfund site, Operable Unit 1, Proposed Cleanup Plan. My name is Kathleen Kennedy, and I'm the EPA Community Involvement Coordinator for the site. You will also be hearing from Katie Mishkin, the Remedial Project Manager for the site, during this presentation. EPA is committed to protecting public health, and with the current COVID-19 health emergency restrictions and recommendations, this video is being published in place of an in-person public meeting. The presentation in this video has the same information that EPA would have shared during an in-person meeting. The goal of this presentation is to provide information on the Jackson Ceramics site and the Superfund cleanup process. Katie will discuss the proposed plans for cleanup of a portion of the site referred to as Operable Unit 1. EPA is accepting comments in a number of ways on the plan for cleanup of the site. Details on how you can provide comments to EPA will be covered later on in this presentation. Please see the Jackson Ceramics site webpage for the full text of documents discussed here and additional information or updates on the site at any time. Katie, please go ahead. Thank you, Kathleen. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Mishkin, and as Kathleen mentioned, I'm the Remedial Project Manager on the Jackson Ceramics Superfund site. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this virtual public meeting presentation for the Jackson Ceramics Superfund site, Operable Unit 1, Proposed Cleanup Plan. I'm going to tell you about the Superfund site, some background and history, and describe EPA's preferred plan for addressing the remaining site contamination. The red line on this map shows an outline of the Superfund site. Jackson Ceramics is located in Falls Creek, Pennsylvania, and extends across two counties, Jefferson County and Clearfield County. The next closest city is Du Bois, which is less than two miles away. Jackson China Company operated between 1917 to 1982 as a manufacturing facility that produced and painted China. The manufacturing processes and waste handling practices resulted in the release of contaminants to the environment, principally lead and organic compounds. In the early 1980s, the company changed its name to Jackson Ceramics and operated until it declared bankruptcy in 1985. A lot of work has already been done at the site by EPA and the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, the Pennsylvania DEP. For example, EPA removed highly contaminated sludge and sediments back in the late 1980s, and Pennsylvania DEP excavated a lot of material, treated it with Portland cement, put it back on the land, and placed the landfill cover with a vegetative cap over it. This occurred in the late 1990s. Jackson Ceramics became a Superfund site in 2005 in order to continue the cleanup. EPA has assessed additional actions needed to address long-term risks and any remaining contamination not previously captured by earlier actions. The Jackson Ceramics Superfund site is 233 acres. It was less obvious in the previous map, but it is important to note that an active rail line known as the Buffalo-Pittsburgh Railroad crosses the site. During cleanup, a site can be divided into a number of distinct areas depending on the complexity of the contamination associated with the site. These areas, called operable units, allow EPA to address different portions of the site at a time. At Jackson Ceramics, the site has been divided into three operable units. Operable Unit 1 is outlined in red and is where the former manufacturing operations took place. This is the topic of this presentation. Operable Unit 2 is outlined in purple and is a 200-acre wetland area known as Sandy Lick Creek Floodplain. Operable Unit 3 is the groundwater underlying Operable Unit 1 and 2. Cleaning up Superfund sites is a multi-phase process. The Jackson Ceramics site underwent assessment and was added to the National Priority List, otherwise known as the NPL, in 2005. During the remedial investigation, the nature and extent of contamination is fully identified and a risk assessment is conducted. The remedial investigation was completed for all operable units in 2018, but only operable unit one has moved to the next step in the Superfund process, which is a feasibility study. This is when potential treatment options are identified and evaluated. Following the feasibility study, EPA proposes a cleanup plan and allows for public comment on that plan. We are currently in that comment period on the proposed plan. 
Following the public comment period, EPA issues a final record of decision, which is a formal and legal document that includes the cleanup plan. It is after the record of decision that we enter the phase of remedial design and remedial action. This is when detailed cleanup plans are developed and implemented. You will also notice that site redevelopment can occur at any stage of the process. EPA is committed to assisting the borough in redevelopment efforts. This is also why EPA has made Operable Unit 1 a priority and is moving through this timeline faster than the other operable units. As EPA is developing the cleanup plan for any site, there are nine criteria that are used to evaluate the possible alternatives. EPA has completed an individual evaluation of each remedial alternative for the Jackson Ceramic site against the first seven criteria. We looked at the relative advantages and disadvantages of our preferred alternatives based on the consideration of these criteria. As we are in the public comment phase, we are currently evaluating the last two criteria, state acceptance and community acceptance. This public comment period is important because it allows us an opportunity to seek feedback from you, the community, before making any final decisions regarding our long-term cleanup plan. The focus of this presentation will be on Operable Unit 1. Operable Unit 1 encompasses all of the land affected by former site activities west of and including the Buffalo and Pittsburgh rail line. It is 37 acres and is mostly located in Jefferson County, though a small portion in the southeast is located in Clearfield County. There are three areas of concern within Operable Unit 1, and they are known as the former manufacturing area, the baseball field area, and the northern drainage channel former lagoon. For the rest of the presentation, I will discuss each area of concern separately, providing a description of each, the technologies that were evaluated for cleaning up each area, the criteria that were used to ultimately select a cleanup alternative, and the preferred cleanup alternative for each area of concern. I'm going to begin with the former manufacturing area. Just to provide some perspective about the former manufacturing area, the pictures that I am sharing were taken in May of 2019, standing on top of the landfill cover. In this first picture, you can see the monitoring wells where we collect groundwater samples to evaluate the quality of water at the site. This picture shows the tracks that are part of the Buffalo Pittsburgh Railroad, which cuts through the Superfund site. High levels of organic contaminants, such as trichloroethylene, are underlying and adjacent to these tracks in the soil and groundwater. This picture shows the extent of the landfill cover that was installed by the Pennsylvania DEP in the late 1990s. The former manufacturing area is about 21 acres in size. It is mostly capped with the landfill cover that was installed by Pennsylvania DEP. Just for reference, the black outline here is the former location of the China Manufacturing Building, which is no longer present today. The contamination that we are addressing is shown in the yellow-orange color. The contamination is mostly present underlying the railroad and on the southeast side of the railroad. This is where we have principal threat waste. Principal threat waste is contamination that is highly toxic or mobile. In this case, it is composed of organic compounds known as volatile organic compounds. Contamination is present in the former manufacturing area in soils and groundwater. EPA has defined specific goals to eliminate the principal threat waste, so potential exposures to people are eliminated and to maintain controls on the land so this land continues to be zoned for industrial commercial purposes. If you are interested in learning more about the contaminants of concern, please visit the site profile page shown in this presentation, and these details are provided in the proposed plan. For the former manufacturing area, three alternatives were evaluated and compared against the seven criteria discussed on the previous slide. It is required that we compare active alternatives to a no action alternative as a basis of comparison. In summary, alternative one is a no action alternative meaning EPA would not take an action to remediate the remaining contamination present at the former manufacturing area. Alternative two and three both include repair of the existing soil cover that was installed by Pennsylvania DEP. The soil cover has some depressions and holes and we wanna fix those so precipitation won't cause contaminants present under the cover to leach or travel into groundwater. Alternative two includes in-situ thermal treatment of the source area underlying and surrounding the railroad. 
Alternative three includes in situ chemical treatment of the source area underlying and surrounding the railroad. Both active alternatives two and three also include institutional controls that would prevent residential development of the property and include some requirements to control vapors in the event that there is construction of a new building. While EPA evaluated three alternatives for addressing contamination at the former manufacturing area, we only looked at two active alternatives since alternative one does not take an action. EPA has selected alternative two as the preferred alternative since it effectively addresses all the contamination in the fastest time frame in less than a year. The in-situ thermal will directly address principal threat waste and therefore is a permanent solution. Overall, alternative two provides the most protection to human health in the shortest time frame. So what do we mean when we say in-situ thermal remediation? In-situ thermal remediation removes harmful chemicals in soil and groundwater using heat. The chemicals move through soil and groundwater toward wells where they are collected as vapor, then piped to the ground surface to be treated using other cleanup methods. It is described as in situ because the heat is applied underground directly to the contaminated area. The actual heating takes place for three to six months and it's one of the fastest remediation technologies as well as a permanent solution to contaminant removal. This graphic shows in situ thermal remediation. On the surface, we would have a power supply, treatment units, and piping on the ground. The heaters or electrodes would be in the subsurface. To provide a greater understanding, this picture shows an example of a Superfund site in New York where in situ thermal was applied. The baseball field area is five and a half acres and located north and adjacent to the former manufacturing area and west and adjacent to the northern drainage channel former lagoon. This is a recreational area with residential zoning in the northern part of the property and industrial commercial zoning in the southern part of the property. Here is where the borough has a park, which includes a baseball field, basketball courts, a playground, and a pavilion. At this location, we just have one contaminant of concern, which is arsenic, that was found at a single location and was surrounded by clean soil. Our goal for the baseball field area is to prevent human exposure to this one contaminant detection of arsenic. No one is currently exposed since it's covered with soil and grass, but it exceeds our remediation standard and therefore it must be removed. EPA evaluated two alternatives for the baseball field area. Alternative one is a required no action alternative to serve as a basis of comparison. Alternative two is removal of soil and offsite disposal. EPA has selected alternative two as the preferred alternative for the baseball field area. EPA would eliminate the potential risk that is posed by the one arsenic exceedance by removing the soil, which would be a small scale effort. EPA will also be doing a sampling event in late August to confirm that contamination is still present at this site. If arsenic is no longer found above our safe criteria, our plan will change to no further action rather than excavation and we will include this update in the record of decision. The third area of concern is the northern drainage channel former lagoon. It is adjacent and northeast of the former manufacturing area and it is east-southeast of the baseball field area. The northern drainage channel is a forested wetland with several surface water bodies and comprises most of this area. The former lagoon is a former 7,200 square foot online sludge settling lagoon that received processed wastewater, often containing lead, from the facility. The main contaminants of concern at the northern drainage channel former lagoon are lead and zinc. Lead and zinc are currently present in the soils, sediments, and surface water. The former lagoon is also connected to the Sandy Lick Creek floodplain on the other side of the railroad via a 48 inch culvert pipe. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, the Sandy Lick Creek floodplain is considered operable unit two and will be addressed later. To provide perspective for the Northern Drainage Channel former lagoon, I am sharing some photos of the area. The majority of this area of concern is the Northern Drainage Channel, which is heavily forested wetlands. Surface water channels are present throughout the Northern Drainage Channel and they merge at the former lagoon. The former lagoon is where we have our highest levels of lead and zinc found in soil and sediments. 
EPA's goal with cleaning up the northern drainage channel of Former Lagoon is to prevent human exposure to lead and prevent exposure of birds and mammals to lead and zinc. This photo shows a white chalky substance in the soil that is found in the former lagoon as well as an operable unit too. This is an indicator where there are extremely high levels of lead in soil. For the northern drainage channel former lagoon, four alternatives were evaluated, including the no action alternative, which is a requirement again to include for comparison purposes. Each of the active alternatives include addition of additives to the soil to reduce the toxicity of lead and zinc in the environment. Alternative two includes excavating a lot of the contamination and removing it off-site. Alternative three includes the addition of a soil cap to cover up high concentration material in the former lagoon rather than removing it. And alternative four includes excavation of just the contamination in the former lagoon and addition of additives to the soil throughout the northern drainage channel. Each of the active alternatives include institutional controls, which will restrict residential development of the lands. EPA's preferred alternative is Alternative 4. Alternative 4 was found to be the most implementable as it removes the highest concentrations of lead and zinc in soil and sediment, while protecting and enhancing regrowth in the wetland in the northern drainage channel. The preferred alternative for the northern drainage channel former lagoon for which I will show a figure soon, includes addition of additives to reduce the toxicity of lead and zinc. We are referring to this as in situ stabilization. So what exactly does in situ stabilization mean in this context? EPA would apply additives to the soil, either by spraying them on, mixing in, or via a drip irrigation system. And this additive will reduce the toxicity of lead and zinc. One example of an additive that we are looking at is called biochar. Biochar is an organic material that can be placed back into the environment and metals such as lead and zinc will bind to it. We have an ongoing tradability study where we are determining what additive can best bind to metals in the soil. Biochar or whatever additive we select will also promote more vegetation to grow, which will help to continue to reduce the toxicity of lead and zinc in the environment as well as to promote the health of the wetlands. This figure represents EPA's preferred alternative for the northern drainage channel former lagoon. The orange hatched area represents the former lagoon and where we have the soil and sediments with the highest concentrations of lead and zinc. This also represents material that we will remove, treat, and dispose of off-site. The green hatched area and the majority of this area of concern is the northern drainage channel. This is where we will apply additives to the soil to reduce the toxicity of lead and zinc and promote the regrowth of the wetland vegetation. Just to recap, since I went over a lot of information, there are three areas of concern within Operable Unit 1. The former manufacturing area, the baseball field area, and the northern drainage channel former lagoon. EPA has discussed the preferred remedial actions that would be taken in each of the areas of concern. The preferred alternative for the former manufacturing area is alternative two, which involves repair of the existing soil cover that was installed by the Pennsylvania DEP in the late 1990s, treat the VOC source area underlying and adjacent to the railroad via in-situ thermal treatment, and apply institutional controls to maintain industrial commercial zoning and require vapor mitigation in the event of the construction of a new building. The preferred alternative for the baseball field area is excavation of the arsenic in soil and off-site disposal. As a reminder, if contamination is not confirmed when sampling takes place later this month, this will turn into a no further action remedy. Lastly, the preferred alternative for the northern drainage channel former lagoon is excavation of the high concentration of metals in soils and sediments in the former lagoon and application of additives to, to the northern drainage channel to reduce the toxicity of lead and zinc and promote vegetative regrowth. This alternative also includes institu institutional controls to prevent residential development. Thanks, Katie, for that detailed explanation of the three areas of Operable Unit 1 and EPA's preferred alternatives. As Katie also explained, these are EPA's preferred alternatives, but community input and questions on the plan are considered. That is why EPA is accepting comments on this proposed plan between August 31st 
and September 30, 2020. Following the comment period, EPA will consider and address all comments received in that final cleanup plan called a record of decision. Comments can be submitted three ways and all means of submission will be treated equally. You can submit comments via mail to US EPA Region 3, Attention, Katie Mishkin, 1650 Arch Street, mail code 3SD22, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103. Comments can also be submitted via email to mishkin.kaffrin at epa.gov or verbal comments will be accepted via phone by calling 215-814-2007. Please note that the phone number provided is a voice mailbox only and you must leave a message with your comments. Remember to speak slowly and clearly and include your name and phone number in case we need to reach you for any clarification. As a reminder, the potential for redevelopment is not contingent on EPA completing the remedial action. Redevelopment can occur at any stage of the Superfund process. As mentioned earlier, EPA is providing assistance to the borough to help in redevelopment efforts. And this is why Operable Unit 1 has been made a priority. Please feel free to contact us with any questions or comments. Thank you again for taking the time to listen to this presentation on the proposed plan for Operable Unit 1 at the Jackson Ceramic Superfund site.